Okay, welcome back to the Jiu-Jitsu Mindset. I'm here with my professor, Professor Lucas Hubo. Good morning. Good morning, Peter. How's everything going? Everything is going good. I'm here with submission coffee in my cup. So I'm feeling oh, ready. Can't, it's, can't miss that. that that's I, I, like a day without submission is a bad day training, man. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, all my business friends tease me like you talk about submission coffee and you don't say where you can get it. So the jujitsu mindset.com. We're happy to take your uh, subscription there. If you want to join me in my morning coffee um, and you know, we've, I think we've mentioned this once before, but I am really proud of what we built for these kids, Professor. Are you can tell any, tell us about what we did. Man, it's been was a great time. Uh, so we just built this online course for kids between seven to fourteen years old. Uh, try to build this relationship with the parents and stick with jujitsu, and it's fun. Like most yeah. and everything, I think it's a great content for the kids to learn jujitsu and be able to maybe practice a little bit with parents or for whoever on their home. But more than that, it's fun. Yes. And uh, I think that we're all going to love it. It was a great time. I, yeah. And you look great. And I, my favorite one is that my sneak attack of you. So it's worth the price. I remember of that. Yeah. I remember <laughs> just, that. <laughs> just that. Well, our next row. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Professor, we have been, I mean, the divine has been so good to us, right? I mean, every week somebody, we get to talk to somebody amazing and this week's no exception. Uh, and Today, we're going to talk to Keith Steinacher. I have permission, by the way, not to call him Professor Keith. So I, you know, I always, with as a beginner, make sure I properly respect all of my jujitsu uh, teachers, mentors, and professors. But he told me it's okay just to call him Keith. Uh, so Keith, thanks for, thanks for spending some time with us. We look forward to talking to you today. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. And uh, just, you know, during, to address that, I, I totally understand the the respective title and, and things, things like that. I, my, my coach was, was of the same kin where he's just like, just, just call me Kyle, call me coach. You know, right. we we're, we're from the Midwest U S we, we, I think we kind of feel a little weird with too much formality. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, Keith, I just will tell you right now, you know, I, when I get my black belt, my children will call me professor. I, <laughs> I will only respond to. So should that day come, who knows when, you know, Professor Lucas says, you know, 32 years from now when I get my black belt, I'm a slow <laughs> learner. Uh, I'll be holding on to it. Jiu Jitsu. I, yeah. I heard that you're going to have a picture of yourself on our house and every, every morning your wife smile <laughs> for the picture. <laughs> One thing at a time. I got to just survive uh, to the next thing. But I mean, what I that respect that gets conveyed through the title, I mean, jujitsu has such profound effects on people and it changes their lives in, in ways that, you know, some people uh, on from the outside, I think, oh, well, why do you guys talk about it in such profound terms? Why does it um, mean so much to you? Why is it, you know, why is the community uh, as supportive and tight as it is? And so, so Keith, the first question I wanted to ask you, given that, if Jiu-Jitsu hadn't played such a prominent role in your life. How do you think your life would have gone differently if you had um, picked something else to pour all your passion and interest and creativity into? That's, that's a good question. The uh, the thing about, you know, holes in people's lives is that they will fill them with something. Mm -hmm. And you're definitely right on that. And I, and I, I was really lucky to have stumbled across jujitsu. I was <clears throat> lifting weights at the time and, and going to like a local wellness center. And, uh, I happened to, you know, walk past the common room and there were, you know, a handful of guys and they're just rolling around on mats and they, they were all white belts at the time, but they, that was the, the only thing in the area, you know, mm -hmm. all the way to, you know, like an hour, hour and a half away to get to any kind of training for with a real instructor. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I went in there and I had wrestled in high school right. and, you know, I, I loved doing that. But when I went to college, I went to a trade school, so I didn't keep, you know, training. And then I saw that and I was like, Oh, this looks fun. This is way more exciting than picking up heavy things and putting them down again. Right. <laughs> uh, and the guy that was in there was a guy I went to high school with named Logan and uh, Logan Wayne. He's got his own school as well. Nah, but he, he, he's like maybe 150 pounds dripping wet right. and he beat the absolute brakes on me. And I was like a, an ultra heavyweight wrestler, wow. you know, in high wow. school. So, 
I, I, I immediately needed to know what sort of <laughs> he was using. Uh, cause and it was, it was exciting to me, but at that time also, I was, uh, you know, going through kind of a rough time in life. I wasn't healthy. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it was affecting my, my mental health a lot as well. And it was, uh, when I started training, we were even with just that group there, uh, mm -hmm. there was a noticeable increase in my mood and, and overall outlook to the point where if I didn't go for a few days, my wife would be like, you need to get out of here because your <laughs> your attitude is horrible you need to go go train right. yeah. that's when you see how uh how much impact does in someone's life or on their on their day right on when your wife wants to go back to the room <laughs> like uh, you can't <laughs> we can't handle that anymore go back train yeah well my my wife is a she's a wonderful person and i think that because she you know is that kind of person she's always looking for uh you know things in our relationship you know she's she's looking at me she's not looking just at herself it's it's a really uh positive thing so she notices when you know i'm not feeling well even if i because you know we're guys we don't say anything sure, sure. Uh, you know and and she has a number of times in my life been that you know that lighthouse to say you know this is this isn't good you need to change course so, but so yeah. it sounds like there was a pivot at some sort. Like it, it sounds like jujitsu comes at a period of time where you have a self awareness. Like, okay, there, there are things that are not serving me well, and you, you know, you're choosing a different route. Um, and so, how, like, could you talk a little bit about uh, how jujitsu plays into you making those adjustments and kind of what that means as you? Because we're we're talking about many years ago at this point, right? Yeah, I was I was 29 at the time. I'm 42 now, right. and uh, it, like I said, I, I I hate to to venture to say where I would be if I hadn't you know gotten into this because my health wouldn't have gotten any better and my mental health wouldn't have gotten any better. So, mm -hmm. you know, not to speculate, but it wouldn't have been great. Okay. Uh, but I think that you know, in in the process of getting into jujitsu and kind of getting in that uh, that mindset, you know as you guys call your podcast. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, it really helped me improve a lot of other areas in my life. Um, I, I think I, I had more success at work. I also went back to school at the same, you know, like sometime thereafter. Mm -hmm. uh, and it helped me kind of stay the course because, you know, you got, I have kids, I had younger kids at the time Sure. and, you know, going back to school and working and, all the, all those things. It's like, I think it was the only thing that kept my, kept my sanity in a lot of cases. So, but it also kind of gave me the cr improvements to critical thinking to work through a lot of, a lot of things at work and at school, you know, and in day-to-day -day life. So I think that was a, a big positive as well. And it continues to be that. So uh, Keith, uh, for what I understand the way how everything started was just like, you know, not in a formal format. Right, like just rolling around some white belts uh, at the at the gym, and then I believe you probably end up going and finding right your, your place and everything. And my question is, since so so many things changed uh, for better in your life, uh, do you have like someone guiding you through that once you start your jiu-jitsu? Like, hey, let's how about this? Let's how about look at the life in a different way or, or this situation? Why do you think it changed? It made you change so much from the that year that you were twenty nine to now in between that training. That's that's yeah, that's that's an awesome question. The uh, so, so a few months after I started training, I was just doing some no gi stuff with my friend, and then uh, his instructor uh, is who I ended up you know going under, but he was a good ways away, so it was a lot of travel mm -hmm. for training at the time. But it was it was worth it, and uh, that's Kyle Watson. I don't know if you guys have heard of him. He's a mm -hmm. UFC vet and, and, uh, was on tough 12, but he's, he's been big on the, uh, jujitsu competition scene, uh, as well. And, you know, one of the things that really, uh, helped that guiding process was that Kyle is a great mentor. You know, he, he, he leads by example. He, he lives his life in a way that, you know, you look at it and you're like, well, I mean, he's making these choices and, and having success. So maybe I should emulate, some of of these choices and thought processes uh and then in addition to that too you know that when you have a great instructor they create a great culture and environment around the students 
Mm-hmm. And I think that that's part of it too. That, you know, they say that you, you are the person you surround uh, the, yeah, the five right. people you surround yourself with. Yeah. And uh, you know, I had a lot of great relationships that were made through jujitsu uh, at my school. Um, and I think that was a good part of it too. Cause you spend time with those people. They're good people. They, they help lift you up and you do the same for them. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's, that, that, that's probably the main part of it. The relationships. Um, I was also traveling a lot for work. So I had the opportunity to travel Uh, all over the country, Japan, Mexico. So I've trained uh, a lot of places. Peter, we see the story repeat itself, right? Yes, right. We started jiu-jitsu, most of us, for to to learn jiu-jitsu or to have this physical activity. That's how we think the reason why, right? And then we see mostly of us staying because of the relationship with people, Mm -hmm. because of the community, because everything good that brings to us right and then you see the the life changes through that it's it's awesome to see the path right every penny it's pretty cool without a doubt i mean that that um and we've seen and we've heard so many dramatic stories of like yeah you know we, i mean we won't we won't press you on what what roads you were headed down but we'll 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 understand that um they were the outcomes would have not been what you what you wanted and having the, had the chance to train outside the United States, even if it was for brief periods of time, could you talk about, I mean, on balance, we talk with folks that either live in the United States or go back and forth between here and Brazil, but this international community of jiu-jitsu, could you comment on like what you observed when you trained in other countries? Yeah, and it, and it was it was a really enlightening experience because it, uh, in Japan and Mexico, um, when you when you walk in the room, you're obviously not from there. You know, sure, they, they yeah. look at you and they're like, "Oh, this this guy's not from around here." <laughs> and, uh, yeah. But it, it's it's not. I mean, you get a few like odd looks and and you know like looks of surprise when you know somebody comes in that's clearly not from the area. Uh, international training, uh, you know, partner, uh, but they the response is always the same where it's okay, well, he's here to train. So once they figure out that you have the right attitude, then you're just part of the crew. Yeah. I mean, there, there is that, that, uh, interview process, the silent interview where they just kind of check you out and see how you act. And, um, but you know, it's that same, I guess for me, the, I always try to go over the top on the respect for them because that's their house. Sure. It's their rules. So I, I come in and try to, you know, do everything b- bowing before I get on the mat, even if I know nobody's told me I'm supposed to do it, you know, b- extra bowing, you know, <laughs> being polite and respectful, um, you know, and usually they'll come up and say, you don't have to do this, that, or the other, you know, cause they get embarrassed by the additional respect in, in some cases, but it, it, it's, it's appreciated. And then that silent interview is closed and then you're just part of the crew and then you come in and train and everybody has a great time, even if you can't understand each other, which was the case in both Mexico and Japan, the the part of Mexico I was in, you know, there was a, they, there was a guy in class that understood a little bit of English. Right. So it was mostly, you know, I would just watch what the instructor did and then I would do it with my partner and he would like nod at me or shake his head, <laughs> no, re, re-demonstrate, but they were all very patient. And uh, it was an interesting experience in Japan as well, because I, at first I had a hard time finding the school. Mm-hmm it was like under a house in this basement. And, and, you know, you're like getting ready to go down these creepy stairs. Like you just <laughs> speak easy. <laughs> yeah. but, then you, but then you go down and like I said, in Japan, everything, you know, people are very proud of, of a lot of things, their, their, their businesses, their homes, their, you know, what have you. And you went in and you could tell they were very proud of it. Everything was clean. It was, you know, tip top shape. And they had like a procedure for how you're supposed to go through things there. And, uh, but they once once they understood I wasn't, you know, again, going through the silent interview process, once once they understood that I was there to train and be respectful, then I was just part of the part of the crew. Yeah, the even, international even language. Even if we couldn't talk to each other. What was yeah. that? It was the international language of jujitsu in, in the silent interview. I'm sure they're like, do we send the Matt Enforcer over there with him or is he OK, <laughs> to, you know, to, yeah. to be? <laughs> well, and I've, I've, I've had the opposite experience as well in, in the U.S. I, I visited a, a gym in uh, California and, uh, you know, I was in there training and, you know, the students didn't really give me any trouble. But the 
the I noticed the instructor would like nod to people and then they would come over and roll with me. It's like he was trying to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it was uh, I was a blue belt that time, and uh, but I, you know, I had wrestled and I moved, I moved pretty good for a big guy, but I, I never tried to hurt anybody. Of course, I always try to, you know, even when they're trying to beat me up, I'm still gonna, you know, kill them with kindness. Yeah. (laughs) Well, having you know been worked under Kyle, Kyle is this great competitor. You know, someone with all this competitive experience as a part of their life. Could you talk a little bit about like the role of competition in a person's development of jujitsu? You know, we 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 like to think about it as um, something that is a net positive. That you know, not to not everybody doesn't need to go be the world champion per se, but the the dynamic that exists between you know competitors at a tournament is very difficult to replicate, uh, and so we often encourage people to do that. So. Um, I'm just curious what your perspective on that is, especially being so close to somebody who competed in such high levels. If that was like insisted on, encouraged, maybe it was diminished, like, you know, it's not important. Where, where, where do you come on that? Yeah. So I, again, I try to mimic a lot of the philosophies that my instructor has, you know, mm-hmm. because, you know, I've seen them be, be tested and tried and true. Right. So, you know, we, we keep what works, we throw away what doesn't work and a lot of what he does work. So I, I follow his, his uh, thought process on it. And he typically will just tell people that, you know, I'm, I'm not expecting you to compete. Mm-hmm. I encourage you to compete. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I take that philosophy as well. So I'll tell my students that, um, you know, I, I hope you will compete at least once because mm-hmm. you need to, you need to experience the that level of violence because it's different from your training partners your training partners care about you and even when you're going hard in class they they're never going to try to hurt you if they actually if you have the right culture right uh, at your gym and i think that when you go to a tournament i mean they there's still some people that are pretty compassionate when they're competing against you but they're there to win and Mm -hmm. you know there's going to be people that aren't compassionate they don't care if they hurt you Mm-hmm. So you, you have to be able to protect yourself. Um, and I think that that's something that you can only experience in a, in that kind of environment. You know, we, we talk about jujitsu and its benefits, but when you're really good at jujitsu, you can take somebody that's trying to hurt you and you can minimize the damage mm-hmm. and you can protect them if need be. So uh, an example of, uh, somebody that's into mental health care, mm-hmm. you know, they need to physically protect themselves, but they're not interested in hurting this person who either has a mental disability or some some problem where they're they're trying to hurt you and they don't even know why. Right, and it right, takes right. that level of mastery in jujitsu to be able to protect them and yourself mm-hmm. at the same time. So I think yeah. I don't know if I wandered off track. No, there. you didn't wander off track no, at all. Yeah, okay. I mean. The, gen- the gentle art, right? I mean, that's, yeah. uh, you know, and uh, the, I think that we have a friend, Professor Jason Hawkins wrote this great book called, you know, Light on the Gentle Art, the Jiu-Jitsu Sutras, and that uh, being able to create boundaries with people, you know, where you're, you have firmness to it, but then a gentleness that, you know, doesn't, that works with the force, as we talk a lot with uh, having leverage. Um, and so, being able to be present to somebody trying to create violence uh, with you in a way that uh, allows you not to get hurt, protect yourself, but, th- but doesn't have the intent of like destroying, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, and hurting that other person. I think um, it feels and often like uh, is unique in, in the jujitsu experience from a competitive and from a violent sort of perspective. I just feel like it's a little different perspective than maybe like Muay Thai or something that mm-hmm. has, a, has a much more um, violent intent. Right. I mean, yeah, you can't generally kick somebody's leg off. There is no, <laughs> there is no leg tap. And you know, there's a, um, well, in these years of studying and teaching, do you have a favorite story of, uh, how you've seen jujitsu come into one of your students' lives or someone in the community's lives and how it changed their life? Yeah, I have uh, one one that's uh, a student of jujitsu uh, and then another that, that trains at our school that he was primarily in, 
into into kickboxing, but I, I kind of lump it together in the in the combat arts right. uh, effect. And the the one I, I do have a student that that works in you know mental health, and he deals with a lot of emergency medical cases for these folks, and he he gets attacked so frequently. <laughs> I mean, he, oh I think goodness. he uses jujitsu more than more than police officers do. Wow, I and, bet. And, and you know, some of them are like psychotically violent some of them are just violent because they don't know what they're doing mm -hmm. um, you know and he and he talks about a lot of the cases there and you know it, it, he, he's prevented from getting hurt a lot you know his co-workers he helps them out a lot because they don't have the first clue what to do in these situations and the, the training they receive is is like a mockery of grappling it's it's mm -hmm. you know to make insurance companies happy basically yeah so that that was the main one. I mean, he's had a huge positive impact, uh, you know, in his life because of that, especially at work, you know. And then the other one was uh, like the one that meant the most to me probably was <clears throat> this guy had been training with us for six, eight months, something like that. And, and you know, pretty rigorous uh, cardio and, and strength training in the Muay Thai, you know, kickboxing style training. Mm -hmm. And he was on a float trip, which I don't know if you guys have ever heard of those before it's where you get on a canoe or a raft and go down a mm. kind of a, a river with some rapids not not too bad but mm -hmm. uh, you know mostly it's beer, beer drinking <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, but Sounds anyway great. he was he was he was out with a couple uh like his daughter and a couple of her friends or something like that and uh the you know the kids had gotten ahead in their canoe and the 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 canoe had dumped and somehow the the girl the friend got stuck up against this tree underwater and her oh face goodness. was maybe like two inches from the water surface. So her face was right there and she couldn't get above water. Uh -huh. um, oh, so yeah. he, you know, he got there and he, you know, jumped up on this, this tree stump or this tree log that was kind of next to it in the water. And it's, you know, covered in mud and moss and everything else. And he had to, cause he couldn't figure out where she was caught. So he just reached down and hooked under her arms probably. And, pulled her face above the water line right. and held her there for 15 minutes until somebody else, you know, came and he, you know, after they, ex you know, they came and got her unhooked and, and got her out, he like collapsed on the, the shoreline. And, and he sure. said, I, I would have had to watch that girl die if I hadn't had the kind of training that wow. you know, comes from combat sports, because he goes, I, I didn't have the mental fortitude before or the physical ability to do what was required of me that day. Yeah. You know, so, you know, not everybody's going to have this life altering mm -hmm. uh, experience, but they happen often enough to justify that kind of training for people. That's amazing. That's an yeah. amazing story. Cause I mean, but obviously the woman whose life was saved is the more, you know, obviously impacted person, but that, man who saved her too i mean that was that whole dance between the two that results in a life being saved a person is also then tested you know in the time when you're called upon to do something that is very important can you do it and then to show up and do it you know for the rest of that person's life that's a that's a level of confidence that will probably be pretty unshakable because they'll we we Keith in a in a in a in a less dramatic fashion. Uh, Professor Lucas was talking about a young boy and his brother was being bullied at school, and the and the brother showed up and like said to the bullies, like, if you are going to do this, you have a problem with me, and it it was the safety of the kid who said that is unclear, but what was interesting to me about that is at a young age this boy will know that if he has to show up for a loved one, he had the capacity of it. And so as an adult for this man to have showed up and save this woman, um, it's just a beautiful story. And difficult, I think, for people outside the uh, the mats to recognize the connection between mm -hmm. like being challenged to that degree uh, can affect like such an extreme circumstance. Thank you for telling us that story. And, and I'm amazing. sure, Keith, there's a the students of yours are also super grateful for to have you on his life, right? Because yes. at some point he didn't use any jujitsu, I believe, <laughs> did any jujitsu technique to keep holding 
grow, but the resilience that you, you, you have taught him, right? The, uh, the commitment on like, man, mission given is mission accomplished, right? Like on moments of struggle, we're going to keep working. And that comes from the, this everyday work. So I'm sure he's super grateful to have you. And I'm sure he, he probably already thank you a few times after that, you know, showing how important you were for, the, for that moment of his life. Yeah, I, I totally look at it like, you know, ripples in the water. You yeah, know, you, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, nice. you, you start a school, some students come train there, you know, positive things happen. And it's like, I, I don't own any part of of what he did, but I I like that that reaffirming effect of the ripples coming back and being like, oh, something cool came of this thing yeah. that I did. It impacted other people's lives in a positive way. And that's and that's really what I what I want. And, you know, you do see it a lot in the kids, too, where they they come mm -hmm. into class. They're more confident. They're not getting yes. they're not getting bullied at school anymore. Yeah. So. Well, the, you know, that we've had all these studies that have come out over the last couple of decades about the multi-generational impact of evil. And they talk about like the World War II and the concentration camps having these change the DNA of people over time. But there is this whole other reality, too, of the of the of the ripple effects of, of goodness and of caring and of love. And so the ripples that you're even aware of um, are just a small portion of the ripples that actually happen. You know, I mean, the people, the good that you're doing in the world as a, as an, you know, professor will also go out generations because you'll be changing people and that will change their relationship to their children and so on and so forth. So totally. it's amazing stuff that in our school, that's, one of the things that I, I love about Professor Lucas and our culture, when I see come in, I see the kids and see the care that is being given them and the support and the love and the teaching. I know that for the rest of their lives, they're going to think back on this time when they had it. And maybe one day they'll save somebody's life as well. Um, well, Keith, if people want to find you guys, where, where should they go when they want to either find you in person or online? Like what's, what's, what do you suggest? Yeah. So I have a uh, strategic BJJ dot com the word strategic followed by bjj and then uh, i also am on facebook instagram tiktok uh, under that strategic jujitsu moniker okay and then, uh, a friend of mine and i we actually started a group for uh, bigger grapplers called the girth squad oh and awesome. uh yeah so we, we've got a group on facebook there's like 1700 you know guys and girls in there and we we, we we jokingly say that you can't get in unless you're you know over 200 <laughs> there's some smaller folks in there but, but but really it's more about uh the folks out there that are outside the bell curve yeah yeah too. i mean you know the, the middle of the bell curve is like 170 pounds or something like that so right. you get out toward the the edge of the bell curve and you know the moves work differently for those people yeah. um there's different levels of athleticism and and certainly you know, we're hoping that, that people, you know, that are bigger will find jujitsu and use it as a way to impact their health, uh, both physically and, and, and mentally. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of tongue in cheek stuff that we, we do through that group. We try to do some like open mats and, and eventually I'd like to do some seminars yeah, uh, nice. as well. Um, you know, we, we have some, some tongue in cheek merch, you know, like meal team six rash guard, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, you know uh, good, good, good stuff awesome. like that. Yeah. Yeah. But it's all supposed to promote the positivity uh, and the the camaraderie in jujitsu, where we can all, you know, share a dad joke and do some jujitsu. I love it. I love it. Well, and Mill Team Six is awesome. Mill Team Six is awesome. <laughs> I might go look for that shirt myself. Sure. Well, Keith, thank you for spending time with us. We're so grateful for your stories, and uh, maybe you'll come back and talk with us another time. I'd love to, and hopefully I'll get to train with you guys someday. Oh, we'd love Absolutely, that. Absolutely, man. We'd love but that. I got to prepare some some big boys here for you. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs>